Vita TV. I'm Maria Ochok and today our guest is Talal Taba. Very nice to meet you. Pleasure to meet you. Pleasure is all mine. Actually, really you, nice to meet you. you got the pronunciation correct. That's not oh. very easy. Okay. Uh, um, we're very happy to be here in Kiev. Actually, it's my first visit to Kiev. Mm -hmm. I'm very uh, optimistic by the uh, conference. It's mm -hmm. very well organized. There is a lot of uh, good mix between investors, uh, community, let's say developers, as well as people that are interested to know more about this crypto, growing crypto economy. Uh, as part of Gibral Network, we decided to be a general partner here in the uh, event because basically we want to make sure that we cover all geographies. We've oh. been doing a roadshow across the world and with Kiev and, and Ukraine having, let's say, one of the strongest uh, technical capabilities in terms of developers, uh, we thought we would, we would come here. Uh, one of our partner actually is a fund that was founded by a group of Ukrainian entrepreneurs called really? TAS, a token as a service. Mm -hmm. And their CEO, Ruslan, is sits on our advisory board. So uh, we're very happy to be here in Kiev. We came up with the idea of Gibral Network because uh, we thought that cross-border payments mm -hmm. were very inefficient. Today, yeah. if I'm making, if I'm a laborer and I'm making two, three hundred euros per month, and I want to send it back home, mm -hmm. the bank takes a very big majority of that mm -hmm. amount. Why? Because the bank has to employ employees, they have to pay rent, health insurance, all of that stuff. So we felt that using blockchain technology, you could automate the process of sending money cross-border. Yeah, yeah. But what we realized then after Decentralized we... system. Exactly. So that's, that's the beauty of it, but then it comes with a downside. The downside is the volatility. So if I'm making $200, $300, $400, $500 dollars a month, and I want to send it back home and Bitcoin drops in value 20% or 10% Like overnight. in one day. Yes, yeah. it could happen. In, and as we've seen, there is aggressive sell-off sometimes in the crypto economy. We thought that is a big obstacle for scalability. Mm -hmm. So then our CTO, one of the smartest guys I know, probably the smartest guy I know, he came up with the concept of crypto depository receipt. Interesting. What we call as Crider. So this, we believe, is the new generation of tokens mm -hmm. that is basically self-regulating. What I mean by self-regulating is, and also backed by a real asset. These two uh, concepts of criders is what we believe will make them successful in the future. Which uh, ones? All right, so in the old days, when you used to go to a bank, uh -huh. Maria would basically give a million dollars to the bank, and okay. they would give you a piece of paper saying Maria has a million dollar dollars in, in million dollars, not one dollar. Oh, one million dollars. One million dollars, yeah, yeah. exactly. So, uh, this certificate. But perhaps one <laughs> as well. <laughs> Maybe. Hopefully, after this conference, you'll be able to. We say yeah, not a million one dollar. dollar. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So okay. basically, this certificate says mm -hmm. that you own a million dollars sitting in this bank. Mm -hmm. What we're doing is we created the cryptographic format of that. Mm -hmm. So our Crider is basically a smart contract that tracks the value, mm -hmm. the regulations, and the location of the underlying asset. So. Let's say you have a million digital dollars. Okay. This million digital dollars are on the Gibral platform, mm -hmm. but they are actually backed up by a real uh, dollar in a regulated financial institution. Uh -huh. So what we do is we give real assets, mm -hmm. currencies, equities, commodities, uh, money market instruments, all the assets that we know from the real world, we give them the transaction properties of cryptocurrencies. So you benefit the advantages of crypto and mm -hmm. the advantages of How real do you assets. do that? Okay, so today with Dollar. Yeah. The dollar is stable, yeah. somewhat stable. Well, they, they say so. Yeah, okay. they say so. Or it's it's more stable than more crypto. Stable, yeah, and more stable than hryvnia in yeah. Ukraine. Yeah. Okay. So the dollar is more or less stable. It's regulated and it's insured. Mm -hmm. But if I want to send a dollar transfer from Dubai to Kiev mm -hmm. on Thursday afternoon, mm -hmm. it will arrive on Monday. Yeah. This type of transaction or this process is acceptable in 1950, 1960. Today in 2017, we have enough technology to make that transfer instantaneous. Yeah. So using blockchain, we are able to basically uh, uh, allow for almost instant, near zero fees, cross-border payments in real currencies. Interesting. Why is this important? Because of what we like to call programmatic cash flows. After this, I'll explain the smart regulations part, but today there's a lot of payments that happen in an automated way. So when I rent an apartment, mm -hmm. I know that I have to pay rent every three months, mm -hmm. okay, or every six months, or based on the contract. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but what happens in, in, in the real world is we sign the contract, yeah. we throw it away, and then... Well, sometimes, yeah. 
most of the time. Most of the time. But we don't throw it away. We put it in a in a in, in our desk yeah, or what, yeah, in yeah. our in, in long box. Basically. Exactly. And I have to tell the bank, please transfer uh, one hundred dollars from Talal's account to Maria's account, mm -hmm. assuming the apartment is owned by you. Okay. So this process can be automated, where we have a smart contract mm -hmm. that governs Talal and Maria's apartment, yeah. and you have programmatic cash flows yeah. that go in the form of uh, real currency. So today I'm able to do this smart contract in the Ethereum currency. But as an apartment holder, you don't want to receive Ethereum. You want to receive real dollar that you can pay your uh, grocery shopping, you can pay your insurance, you can work yeah. with in real life. So what we're able to do is we're able to do these programmatic cash flows using real currencies. Oh. Uh, the most important part about Jibril Network is what we call smart regulations. Mm -hmm. Smart regulations is basically a new way of looking at regulations. So, as I told you earlier, we take, we write this contract for rent and we put it away. We believe that using blockchain technology and Solidity code in specific, we are able to automate the enforcement of regulation. Mm -hmm. How? So today, let's say I'm a blacklisted individual in the United States. I'm a criminal and I am not allowed to hold dollars. Okay. Okay, if you give me... Imagine, a, yeah. Yeah, it's not true, by the way. I'm, I'm not blacklisted. <laughs> Okay. Uh, but imagine I have a million dollars of cash. Yeah. Okay, you give me that million dollars of cash, mm -hmm. I can hold that cash, even if I'm blacklisted. Mm -hmm. And I can use that to continue doing the bad activities that I was doing after. But if you have a digital dollar that is linked with the banking system, mm -hmm. this digital dollar will follow real-world regulations in the sense that if you try to send me this digital dollar, mm -hmm. this digital dollar is linked with a back-end of mm -hmm. blacklisted individuals. Mm -hmm. It will refuse to go to my wallet. Interesting. So basically yeah. we, we, we... So it will be regulated, but not in the way that... Yes, a new way of regulating, which we believe is, is the way forward. The government today has to micromanage every single transaction, mm -hmm. and that's very inefficient. Yeah. In the future, you will be able to have that process automated so you achieve what we call governance without mm -hmm. government. So the government's role becomes more of oversight mm -hmm. as opposed to micromanaging every transaction. That's like, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's like the main, like, let's just say, advantage of blockchain True. technology. Um, is this the topic you will be talking at this stage? Uh, at this stage, I'm going to talk a little bit about systemic risk. Mm -hmm. Systemic risk is not very relevant to my project, but I think we propose a solution for that. And mm -hmm. it's important, very important, because if history taught us a lesson, um, if we ignore systemic risk, we will face very bad consequences. So if you look at what happened in the United States in 2008, mm -hmm. That was basically systemic risk leading to an almost collapse of the U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. You had uh, Lehman Brothers go completely bankrupt mm -hmm. because of acting financially irresponsible. And that was going to lead to a domino effect where you had AIG insurance, you had several banks that were going to uh, follow the same, let's say, fate. Mm -hmm. With the crypto economy today, we're not paying attention and we're not calculating systemic risk. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to touch a little bit about how it's very important to look at systemic risk. Systemic risk, to define it, is the idiosyncratic... Uh, all right, let me use something that's a little bit clear. Today, if, uh, it's, it's basically the risk of a collapse of a full financial system because of the collapse of a single entity or a single factor. Yeah. Today, you have a very high concentration in mining pools. All right? Yeah. So these it, it, mining pools, if they conduct a 51% attack, you will have a very, very big effect. 51%, yeah? Yes, 51% uh -huh. attack. If that happens on the Bitcoin blockchain, it will be a huge disaster to the crypto economy. Oh, really? Right? Yes, because you will basically able to rewrite the blockchain. Oh. If you rewrite mm -hmm. the entries in the blockchain, basically people will lose trust in the yeah. system. And the value of cryptocurrencies in general will take a very big hit. So I think it's important to look at uh, systemic risk in the lens of, uh, let's say, cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. But if we want to look at the effect that a potential collapse will have, today the real economy, if the cryptocurrencies today collapse completely, businesses and the traditional economy will not be affected that much because all of the crypto economies together are, or the cryptocurrencies are $200 billion. 200 billion compared to money market. It's for now, yeah? Yes, it's, it's, if you look at the growth rate, yeah, yeah. it was 4 billion at the beginning of the year, today it's 200 billion. 200 billion, All right. correct. This, this, this amazing growth means that we should be excited, first of all. Second of all, we should pay a lot of attention to 
systemic risk because the larger the crypto economy grows the larger are the risks yes, yeah exactly so uh, the risks that would be or the the biggest disadvantage associated with a crypto uh, economy crash mm -hmm. would would be to the build out of web 3.0 Web, well, let me explain what Web 3.0 is. Oh, yeah, of course. Web 1.0 was back in the early 90s when an authorized user was able to go into the internet and post a blog. Mm -hmm. People, as a user, I would go onto the internet and I would read what this authorized user said. Mm -hmm. Web 2.0 involved the exchange of information. Mm -hmm. Emails, WhatsApp, Facebook. That's I exchange right. information with people through the internet. And this revolutionized the way we exchange information. What about Web3? Web3, all right. So before I go into Web3, I'll tell you what effect Web2.0 had on the world. Oh. If Maria wanted to send me a letter to Dubai, yeah. all right, in 1980. I wasn't born then, but let's assume. Yeah. I know you weren't born then either. But in 1980, yeah? Yeah, 1980. Yeah, you said, yeah. Both of us were not. No, born. no, no. But if, but if you wanted to send me a letter back then, mm -hmm. you actually had to write it, give it to the mailman, who would go to a ship, deliver yeah. it all the way. Correct. It would cost a lot of money, take time. it take a lot of time, and it was very inefficient. And you have no idea if it will reach or not. Yeah, of but course. the Web 2.0 allowed us to exchange information seamlessly, all right? And Web 3.0 will allow us to exchange value. Oh. So it is the internet of money. It's now, as they say, internet of money and in, in, the, uh, in the future, internet of things, which yes. we'll be talking about. Internet of Things, I think, for me, is one of the most promising advantage, advancements in the world of technology because combining Internet of Money with Internet of Things is where we really can get a lot of value. So oh. let me give you an example. In my old job, I used to buy fuel from one of the Aramco. Aramco is the Saudi Arabian uh, mm -hmm. fuel company. Mm -hmm. I used to buy fuel from them every Sunday. Uh -huh. Sunday, they would send me the list or the price for Jet A1 fuel, which is the fuel that I was buying. Uh, I would open an LC, line of uh, credit, letter of credit. <laughs> and then that LC was revolving. Every week, I would be so upset by the amount of charges that I have. Why? The pipe in Aramco has a flow meter. <laughs> this flow meter calculates, all right, how much fuel went in. <laughs> Depending on the amount of fuel that went in, they charge me. <laughs> but they charge me using traditional banking <laughs> infrastructure. Why do I give this example? Because this is related very it's very correlated to Internet of Things. Imagine this flow meter inside the pipe yeah. was an Internet of Things device, mm -hmm. all right, IoT device that calculates how much fuel came in. And instead of creating an invoice, doing payables, receivables, mm -hmm. billing, all that unnecessary stuff, a payment is automatically made from my account to the uh, account of the company. The company, yeah, yeah. Through this IoT device, which has a payment solution embedded in it. Okay, understood. Uh, we are coming back to the same uh, topic concerning ICO. How do you feel about ICOs which are now in Ukraine and across the world? So actually, this is a very good time to ask me about ICOs because my ICO starts on Monday. Oh. We have an ICO where we raised between 3.5 and 4 million dollars. Please uh, tell a few more words, a few words about your ICO. Sure. So the project that I explained earlier about yeah, yeah. tokenization of assets, mm -hmm. this is our ICO. So this you're going our... on ICO yes. with this project, yeah. This, this project we are... But is it already a running business? Yeah, so this is a very big difference between us and other ICOs. If you uh -huh. log in to jwallet.network, yeah. we just released the alpha version of our own wallet. Mm -hmm. So we think that a lot of people in this crypto economy are guilty of taking off-the-shelf solutions. Mm -hmm. You know what happened with the Parity hack? Parity, Parity hack? Parity. Uh -huh. Parity is one of the largest, let's say, uh, tech providers in the oh. industry. Mm -hmm. And they had, I think, something more than $100 million locked mm -hmm. and frozen, not available to the users mm -hmm. in the form of Ethereum, because uh, basically people were using this off-the-shelf technology instead of developing their own. So going back to my ICO today, we are raising capital or we're doing a public token sale mm -hmm. using uh, by selling JNT. It's Gibril your token. Yes, it's our token. Mm -hmm. This Gibril network token can be used to transact on our platform, which has the digital assets. So digital dollar, digital euro, digital gold, digital money market instruments. What about cryptocurrency? Also, we have, you can also use Ethereum, Bitcoin. If you look at our uh, wallet, the J wallet, it supports, I don't know how many cryptocurrencies, most of the Ethereum compatible tokens. Mm -hmm. And in the future, we aim to also support Bitcoin on the same wallet. Oh, I see. So, um, 
we took a different approach. We created the products first, mm -hmm. or we created, let's say, the workable products first. We obviously mm -hmm. need to develop them further. But instead of raising money based on a white paper, mm -hmm. we have a workable product. We already have partners in place. We are in discussions with banks, with regulators. So, but going back to the question of ICOs, I think ICOs will revolutionize the way that capital markets run and the way that people raise money. Mm -hmm. However, we need to be careful that you do proper due diligence yeah. before you invest. Because they say that now 95% of the current ICOs are fake. How do you feel about it? Look, I think that it is very difficult to put a number, so 95%. No Out of 100. How, how, how did someone come up with this 95%? Maybe it's Somebody 99%. says 98 or maybe somebody says 99. 99 yeah. No one can really know. And I think, uh -huh. it's, I think we should not focus on this as much as we should focus on the next steps. So mm -hmm. when the internet bubble, we're obviously in an ICO bubble. That is very clear. Uh -huh. When you have coin that you have... Uh, uh, Vitalik Fitcoin, which is basically a coin that serves no... You have, you have several coins today that have absolutely no purpose. Burger yeah. King are doing their own coin. So obviously we are in ICO And bubble. no price. Yes. So we no value, I mean. Nothing, no you, real use case for the coin. Uh, what I think will happen and what will be a great advantage is with ICOs, we're using the open source decentralized type mm -hmm. of, uh, let's say, approach. In the dot-com bubble, I always like to look at history to draw parallels in order to compare. So if you look at the dot-com bubble that happened in the late 90s, the lessons learned were not carried over to the next people. Why? Because it was a tech company, all right, raising money from uh, traditional closed investment. Mm -hmm. And then if it continues, it becomes like Amazon, uh, IBM, uh, not IBM, Amazon, eBay, and the, the PayPal, the pioneers or the unicorns that came out of this. And then you have a lot of companies that failed. Mm -hmm. The companies that failed, the lessons learned, died away with them. But today in the ICO world, since we're doing open source, decentralized, the information is going to be as lessons learned to the next generation of ICO. So that's why I think that the recovery will be a lot quicker than the dot-com bubble. And I also think that blockchain technology will scale faster than the internet for one main reason. is because we have the internet. Oh. The internet is the best way of exchanging information. So. And long ago, nobody believed that internet will be very useful. So, and now they say that blockchain can be a new internet. Look, I think that, uh, again, going back to history, if you look at any disruptive technology, mm -hmm. let's say with the copy machine, you know the photocopy machine? Yeah, yeah, or course. the cars. I'll give a quick story about each to know how people are afraid of change. Mm -hmm. The photocopy machine was, was fought so much by labor unions because business owners were saying, and, and unions were saying, our employees are going to be unemployed. What are they going to do? Mm -hmm. In the old days, you used to have people, their only job is to copy. Yeah, of course. And then when the photocopy machine came, it replaced the All job the... of these people. So, so in the future, it can be the same. People will always refuse new technology until... So there's a cycle uh, of accepting technology. First, people don't want to accept it. Yeah, then they ridicule it. It's something I know, un I know, unknown, yeah. So the first car that was exported from the United States to Britain, mm -hmm. actually there was a requirement of three people to drive the car, mm -hmm. the pilot, the engineer, and the guy to uh, stand in front of the car with a red flag. <laughs> to make Because they thought that this machine was something that would kill people and that's scary. So cars, when they first came to Britain for the first couple of months, mm -hmm. three people were necessary to operate it. So people, or, or let's say society, are always resistant to change. People are comfortable going to a bank and sending a swift transfer. They're afraid maybe to send using Bitcoin. But if you saw over the past three years, people have started to accept this technology because it's more efficient. And I think that the more the traditional economy is involved, the better it will scale. Okay, thank you very much, Salal. So it was very nice to Pleasure. meet you, especially right. from Crypto TV.